Welcome everyone. I'm Karen Trout. I'm the Community Engagement Librarian at Kalamazoo Public Library and we're thrilled to welcome Arnie and Deb and all of you to hear about her their new projects. Um, before we get started, I just I have to talk about our when when the pandemic first happened last year, we had booked Arnie for a reading um, from his new book of poetry. And we had to cancel that as, as we had to cancel so many other things. And together we kind of figured out how do you make a recording without people there? And Arnie really um, dug right in and figured out how to do a recording of his readings from that book of poetry. And we were able to share it after the fact. And here we are 15 months later still doing the same thing, but a little more experienced. So <laughs> we're, we're happy to welcome you both. Um, I want to make a plug for um, Michigan News Agency, which has copies of both of the, the, the picture book as well, Deb? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So both books are available there. Um, the library is still in the process of acquiring both books and you can place holds. Um, and lastly, uh, Arnie and Deb have participated in a new podcast that the library is doing. Uh, Kevin King and Sandra Farrig, our new head of youth services, do a podcast called Five Author Questions. And they do a, a brief author interview and uh, Deb and Arnie were kind enough to participate in that. So uh, I'll try to put a link to that up in the chat here. I also want to just make sure you know that we are recording this so it can be viewed at a later time for people that haven't been able to be here. And I think that's all I want to say. I'm going to let Arnie and Deb introduce themselves and, and launch into their readings. I, I can't see anybody's name out there who doesn't really know us. So <laughs> <laughs> we, would, we would really like to thank the library for doing this, as I've said so many times, I don't think this is ever gonna go away now that people have learned how to do this. Mm -hmm. um, we're gonna read tonight from two books. First, both of us will read from our new children's book, Mr. Robert Monkey Returns to New York. And then Arnie's gonna read from his new novel, Swept Away. And there'll be some time at the end, I think, if you guys wanna ask questions. Gotta be sure I can see here. <laughs> um, so having said that, do you want to add? No. Okay. <laughs> Let's just read. Yeah. Mr. Robert Monkey returns to New York. Why don't you read the dedication? That's sort of nice too. And it's dedicated to our grandchildren, to Bennett, Ella, Stella, and Zoe, all of whom know a thing or two about love. Yes. And it begins with a little explanation called Mudman's. Some tennis shoes are meant for show and others meant for play. Your Mudman's are the ones you wear on a gross and rainy day. You wear them in the sandbox, you wear them in the dust. For tramping through big puddles, your Mudman's are a must. And here's the story. One, Mr. Robert Monkey lived in Times Square by himself. At least he was the only monkey sitting on the shelf inside a tourist shop with many other souvenirs. Mr. Robert Monkey was afraid he'd be sitting there for years. And Bob Panicki came to New York to repair computers for a bank. And he saw Mr. Robert there I'll take that little monkey home to Bobby, he declared. And Mr. Robert smiled because he knew somebody cared. They traveled on a jet plane. Mr. Robert liked the ride. And then in Bob Panicki's car, the two sat side by side, driving out into the country to a big house on a hill with a garden full of flowers, a bird bath, and a grill. Now, Mr. Robert Monkey was a city monkey, true, but looking all around, he knew he'd love the country too. Betty, Bob Panicki's wife, 
was very, very sweet, but Bobby was the friend who made this monkey's life complete. Mr. Robert Monkey was like Bobby's little brother, and if you saw one of them, you'd always see the other. They liked to eat their pizza cold with lots of apple juice and always wore their special hats when reading Dr. Seuss. They built up farms and forts and things with Bobby's building blocks, drove trucks, dug rivers, built dams in Bobby's new sandbox. Sometimes they painted pictures indoors in nasty weather. More than anything at all, they loved to play together. When they both get dirty from the sandbox or the ground, Betty would give them each a bath and scrub them round and round. They'd play on the computer or romp with the neighbor's dogs or wearing mudman tennis shoes, they'd hunt the creek for frogs. When Bobby played at soccer, Betty cheered him from the stands while Mr. Robert wondered why he couldn't use his hands. With Bobby hot and grimy when the game was at an end, but Betty cheered, then drove them home and gave them baths again. Weekdays, Bobby rode the bus to school in a great big yellow bus. And sad as Mr. Robert was, he never made a fuss. But Betty knew how sad he was despite his smiling face so she made sure to put him in a very special place where he could watch for Bobby with a school bag of his own, with lots of friends around him so he wouldn't feel alone. He'd simply wait in Bobby's window till the bus returned and knew that Bobby soon would tell him everything he'd learned. Two. As time went by, the bank in New York City seemed to call for Bob Panicki more and more. So one day in the fall, he and Betty talked it over. And as they talked, they knew that moving to the city was the best thing they could do. They knew they'd miss their lovely house, but wanted to be sure that Bob could travel less and they could see each other more. The two of them sat Bobby down and told him all about how they and Mr. Robert would soon be moving out. Bobby said he'd miss his school and Mudman frog hunts too, but Betty said in New York they'd find lots of things to do. A planetarium, museums, big parks and a lake with ducks and swans and frogs, and every now and then a snake and Broadway shows, and ferry boats, and lots of sights to see like Brooklyn Bridge, and Chinatown, and Lady Liberty. He wouldn't ride a bus to school. He'd simply walk since Bank Street School was near their brand new condo down the block. And Bob promised Bobby that once they moved in there, they'd visit Mr. Robert's souvenir shop in Times Square. And even though he loved his home with Bobby on the hill, Mr. Robert Monkey was a New York monkey still. So Bobby filled his backpack and put on his New York cap while Mr. Robert peeked at him from underneath the flap. And Betty very carefully on every case and bag, including Mr. Robert's, put a destination tag. The movers came and packed so much inside their van, the rugs and all the furniture and every pot and pan. When all the house was empty and it was time to say goodbyes, Bobby, Bob and Betty had to wipe tears from their eyes. Then Bobby put his backpack on and jumped into the car to start the longest journey of his life so far. And sitting in the back seat, with the luggage in a pile, Mr. Robert Monkey smiled his Mr. Robert smile. They drove the super highways and they filled the car with song. But when they stopped for lunch next day, the journey soon went wrong. As they left the restaurant and Bobby bounced his ball, it took a crazy hop and Mr. Robert took a fall. Bobby didn't see him tumble. Betty missed it too, 
Then Bob was pumping gas, so there was nothing he could do. And Mr. Robert Monkey couldn't think of much to say, so he could only watch as the Finickies drove away. Oh, no. Sorry, eh? <laughs> as he lay there all alone just off the beaten track, Mr. Robert knew that after this he'd surely need a bath. He lay till it was almost dark, propped up against a log, but just as he was losing hope, he spied a big old frog. Womp, womp, said Mr. Bullfrog. What's a monkey doing here? I'm lost, said Mr. Robert, and he shed a lonely tear. I'm going to New York, he added, but I don't know how. Womp, womp said Mr. Bullfrog. You should get started now. Bump, bump, said Mr. Bullfrog. You can climb right on my back. So Mr. Robert did, and they hopped off along the track. When they reached a truck stop, Mr. Bullfrog said, right here, you'll find someone who'll take you to New York or very near. So Mr. Robert hopped right off and sat there on the ground, not far from the truck stop's door, so he would soon be found. He said, thank you, Mr. Bullfrog, for helping me today. Look, look, said Mr. Bullfrog, and he turned and hopped away. <clears throat> the robber monkey didn't have to wait too long until a man who drove a truck came whistling a song. Just as he was climbing in his rig, he looked around and saw the little monkey smiling at him from the ground. He decided right away it wouldn't be quite fair for him to leave a friendly little monkey lying there. So he picked up Mr. Robert and he climbed into the rig and sat him on the dashboard with a nodding purple pig. All right, said the pig, and how are you? My name is Iris Pork. <laughs> My name is Robert Monkey and I'm going to New York. <clears throat> I'll help you then, said Iris Pork. I'm quite a ham, you see. Mr. My Broadway is the dashboard, and the only star is me. So the driver drove his semi, and he hummed each country song the radio would play while Iris nodded right along. And when the driver stopped to see his cargo was all right, Iris tumbled Mr. Robert out the window in the night. Mr. Robert lay there till the sun rose the next day when a passing driver saw him and carried him away. He took him to an airport where he had a little plane that seeded clouds for farmers whose field, who had fields that needed rain. Mr. Robert was, was, Mr. Robert soon was in the air flying to and fro. But how he'd get to New York City, he just didn't know. Then suddenly, a gust of wind blew him out of the plane and he landed on a seagull and was rescued once again. When Mr. Robert told his tale, the seagull said, Squawk! Squawk! I'm flying to New Jersey, but I'll take you to New York. Oh, thank you, Mr. Seagull, Mr. Robert cried. If you know where the school is, please leave me right outside. I think it's on the Upper West Side, Mr. Seagull said. If I can't find it, though, I'll drop you at Times Square instead. They flew toward Manhattan and then circled all around. And when they got to Bank Street School, they swooped down to the ground. Squawk, squawk, Mr. Se said Mr. Siegel. I hope you find your friend. And leaving Mr. Robert there, he took to air again. Sitting on the Broadway sidewalk among the passing feet, Mr. Robert smiled and waited. For coming down the street, he saw a man in a uniform. He picked him up and read the address on his little pack, then smiled at him and said, you're lucky, Mr. Mon Monkey. I'm the doorman at that place. And seeing you will put a smile on little Bobby's face. When the doorman took him up to the Panicky's door, Mr. Robert's smile grew brighter than it had been before. When Betty saw him, first she laughed a bit, and then she cried. And next, of course, 
gave him a bath when she got him inside. When Bob and Bobby both came home, all they could do was stare to discover Mr. Robert was waiting for them there. Looking clean and fresh, smiling and ready for the day when he and Bobby could get back to games they loved to play. When Mr. Rob Robert Monkey had been lost without a trace, the happy smile disappeared from little Bobby's face. But Mr. Robert had returned to everyone's surprise, and now the cheerful light was back in Bobby's eyes. Bob and Betty knew that Bobby was a lucky boy, for Mr. Robert Monkey was no ordinary toy. Mr. Robert Monkey was like Bobby's little brother, and if you saw one of them, you'd always see the other. Four. Almost every Saturday, from morning sun till dark, Mr. Robert went with Bobby to play in Central Park, where they'd see ducks and frogs and swans and now and then a snake. And sometimes Bob Panicki took them rowing on the lake. They'd often go to Broadway shows or maybe look around museums or planetariums, then lunch in Chinatown. Radio City, Brooklyn Bridge, so many sights to see. And once they took a ferry boat to Lady Liberty. They'd visit Mr. Bullfrog or his cousins, and they'd talk to Mr. Siegel's relatives, although all they'd say was squawk. Mr. Robert always watched for semis in New York with purple dashboard or ornaments that might be iris pork. He and Bobby built all sorts of farms and forts and things, drove trucks, dug rivers, built mud dams, and played on slides and swings. And when they both got dirty from the sandbox or the ground, Betty give them each a bath and scrub them round and round. They'd play on the computer when the rain came pouring down, and Bobby knew that nothing could make Mr. Robert frown. They still liked their pizza cold with lots of apple juice and always wore their special hats when reading Dr. Seuss. Sometimes they painted pictures indoors in nasty weather. More than anything at all, they loved to play together. When Bobby went to school, though, Mr. Robert wouldn't roam. He'd sit and smile and watch and wait till Bobby came back home. And one day, Bob Panicki took them both down to the shop where, after hours of working at the bank, he made a stop to find a gift for Bobby in the middle of Times Square and bought the little monkey he discovered waiting there just sitting by himself among the other souvenirs and worrying he might be left to sit alone for years. And if you're very lucky, you may have parents who will find a friend like Mr. Robert Monkey just for you. Bravo. There was a question in the chat wondering about seeing some of the um, illustrations. Well, why, why don't, okay. I, we can. Yeah, Debbie can show you. Uh... Let's see what would be fun. There's Mr. Robert on the seagull. All right. In the go. airplane. And there he is being lost at the gas station. <laughs> there. And there he is with the dashboard bobblehead. I love it. Irish pork. <laughs> Here he was on Mr. Bullfrog. Yeah. Those are great. The two sections. Here he is watching for Bobby to come home from school. And that's New York, where they're heading off to. And here they are in Central Park. We've got this big H in the middle. Great. And here are mud mans. When our sons were little and we would go someplace where there was a creek, they always bought their, brought their old tennis shoes and they called them mud mans. So that's why Bobby has them. And here they are at the end All at right, the yeah. super shop. <laughs> nice. 
Great. And here is the lovely young lady illustrated. who illustrated the uh, book and worked with us uh, uh, yep. closely on figuring out what everything should look like. Her name is Kelly O'Neill. And she got a, a BFA in illustration from Syracuse University. And she currently lives uh, in Pennsylvania. So that's great. Mr. Robert Monkey. So now we're going, Arnie's going to read from his brand new novel, Swept Away. It's really wonderful. And I'm going to sneak out of the frame. I'll come back when he's done and sit over there and listen with the rest of you. I'll quickly uh, let you in on the fact that the novel is about uh, a playwright named Dennis McCutcheon, who is struggling to get tenure at a small Eastern University in Pennsylvania. And uh, unexpectedly and fortuitously, he thinks, uh, his alma mater, Wayne State University, uh, asks if uh, he would like them to produce one of his plays. So he thinks his problems are solved and he heads for Detroit for the production uh, and uh, gets into a good deal of trouble in one way or another. So I'll read you the epigraphs to the novel. Uh, one is from Marcus Aurelius. Time is a sort of river of passing events and strong is its current. No sooner is a thing brought to sight than it is swept by and another takes its place and this too will be swept away. And the other one from the sublime to the ridiculous is from uh, a movie, the only one Marlon Brando ever directed, a Western called One-Eyed Jacks and the terrific character actor, Ben Johnson, delivers the following line. Look at here what's happening to Romeo. And I'm going to read you uh, part of the first chapter of the novel just to uh, introduce you to the characters who uh, affect the action most. You're pissed off shifted myself in the snug passenger seat of the Celica, trying to ease the pressure on my hip, and in the process, banging my right knee on the glove compartment. I was already irked, stewing in my own sweat as we sped south on the coastal highway down the Delmarva Peninsula. Eileen Moriarty's little blue roadster closed around me. I didn't so much get into it as put it on, you have two books coming out, I said. I'm the one who's scrambling to qualify for tenure. Don't change the subject. Her left hand on the steering wheel, Eileen jabbed the air sharply with her right index finger, her helmet of curly black hair, lending her words a, an air of electric energy, despite the slightly lazy vowels of her North Carolina drawl. Moving her right hand back to downshift as she stopped for a traffic light, she added, Two books coming out and no word from Finsterwald about a raise. Half the senior faculty don't have two books on their resumes. It's ridiculous. Sex is bullshit, too. She ended with one of her ever-ready Southern pronouncements. It'd make a bishop mad enough to kick in a stained glass window. At least you'll have a job next year, I said, unwilling to surrender the low ground. If something doesn't break for me soon, you may be sharing an office with somebody else. Blew an exasperated sigh that wasn't entirely for effect. With few immediate career prospects and not long divorced, I had difficulty matching Eileen's sense of outrage, probably because she at least had someone to blame besides herself. She didn't do the flashing eyes thing, but her ice blue stare could be daunting. I was in no mood to back down though. I just had a letter from the Tenure and Promotion Committee, I went on. From the horse's ass, Neil Christman, to be precise. He's gotten himself appointed chair of the subcommittee assigned to my file. Where did you get it, she said, sparing me another sidelong laser shot and managing to look annoying and attractive at the same time. 
and this morning's interdepartmental crap collection, very formal, dear Dr. McCutcheon, latex glove, but no Vaseline, <clears throat> telling me if I can't look forward to placing a book in the near future, I'd better see about getting a production with a significant theater company. And he had to add, even though the permanence of a book would be far preferable. I felt my face becoming warm despite Eileen's being well aware of my situation. Screw the TPC and the horse's ass Chrisman rode in on. Eileen gunned the silica away from the light on its way south. That's why we're headed for the shore. We need something to take our minds off academe, off the stodgy Vic George Georgian campus of Brixton University and all those who languish there, pretending a little Pennsylvania college town is Oxford or Cambridge, something completely different. I was always good at changing the subject. I capitulated. So, Monty Python, what's the plan? It's a surprise. I gave her a look, not quite up to her laser eyes. The last time you surprised me, I wound up having to jump head first out of a kitchen window to so Finsterwald's wife didn't catch us drinking his 21-year-old Balvini. I mean, laughed. For a man who recently played El Gallo in the Fantastics, you seem to have mislaid your sense of adventure, buddy. El Gallo's a character in a play, kiddo. Right now, you're stuck with the offstage version, much less adventurous. No kidding. She succeeded in distracting me. I could play at that game. Played El Gallo in the original production? Jerry Orbach. Pre Law and Order? Back when he was an off Broadway song and dance man. The original production ran so long, the New Yorker quit printing its capsule review and replaced it with a weekly excerpt from Ulysses. You're full of random information, aren't you? Playwright Stock and Trade, I said. Eileen gave me a glance she would probably call impish. Capsule Review in the New Yorker gives you something to shoot for. I snorted. Right now, I'd settle for any Capsule Review, maybe in the Scranton Times Tribune. Eileen's <clears throat> tone turned serious. My precarious perch in the department didn't lend itself to our usual banter. Maybe you should look into a dual appointment in theater or move over there altogether. After all, they were delighted to have you as guest artist. Students liked you, reviews were good. English may not be the right place for a playwright. Hell, it's barely the place for a film scholar, not to mention a woman. Most of the senior faculty think film scholars an oxymoron, and they're deathly afraid I'll start agitating for LGBTQ rights. Eileen wasn't saying anything I hadn't thought before. Yeah, I said, they have trouble coming to terms with the march of progress, all right. But my degree's in English, and English is where the job is, and the creative writing classes. Teaching playwriting is just a bonus. Besides, neither English nor theater knows what to do with playwrights. Both departments prefer their writers dead. English because they don't really think playwrights are writers, and theater because if they're dead, they don't have to pay them any royalties. In Hollywood, all the writers are alive and pitching, Eileen said. Makes for a better company at lunches. And after they deliver the goods, the producers just throw money at them so they'll go away. Don't I wish. I exhaled, but couldn't stop myself from going on. And lots of academic directors think they can stage plays any way their egos dictate. Shakespeare in penguin suits, school for scandal with cell phones, never mind the dramatist's guild guidelines. Eileen chuckled. Movie directors win the ego contest hands down, not to mention producers who think they know best. Again, I couldn't stifle myself. Then there's the turf issue. The younger theater faculty are leery of any competition, especially from a playwright who acts. I shifted in my seat to ease the growling ache in my right hip. Sorry about the whining, but you brought up the subject. Well, screw all that for today, Eileen said. But now we're free spirits. As if to reinforce her point, she shifted gears quickly from third to fifth and cut around a windowless white van of the kind favored by serial killers in B-movies. 
I guess if we do something free-spirited enough to land us in jail, we at least won't have to go to Dean Rimmer's party tonight. He laughed again, the alteration in her features reminding me that I was being chauffeured by a beautiful woman. Her look wasn't boyish, it was just all clean planes, devoid of makeup. You might get a one act out of the Rimmer extravaganza, she said. Silver linings, they're everywhere. So where are we headed? Ain't that the question that puts Peppa in the gumbo? So they spend the day body surfing uh, and uh, getting sunburned and arrive late to the Dean's party uh, dressed as they were uh, for their outing down to Rehoboth Beach. And they arrive inappropriately dressed. Ah, it's the odd couple. Green Rimmer, the Dean's wife, twinkled at her own wit in welcoming Eileen and me to her palatial 19th century pile of granite nestled in one of Brixton's wealthy enclaves adjacent to campus. The place featured enough mahogany and expensive bric-a-brac for a masterpiece theater episode. The Rimmer's money obviously came from some source other than academe. Nice party outfits, Corinne added looking at our tropical shirts, shorts, and sandals with a mixture of amusement and disapproval. I told Bart we should have gone with a South Seas motif. Sorry about that, Eileen said, though she didn't sound sorry. I read Rehoboth Beach all day, I said, trying not to give any more offense than we had evidently done already. If we stopped off the change, we'd have been late getting here. You are late, Corinne said, though she certainly didn't seem overly insulted. Some 10 or 15 years younger than her mid 50 ish husband, she wore an improbably short little black dress that came close to revealing what my dear departed mother would have called her whimwham, and which sported a neckline that grew, drew attention to her other major assets. She seemed well aware that Brixton students, staff, and faculty, not to mention spouses, wasted time almost daily on speculation as to why she had married Dean Barton Rimmer, who looked less like an academic and more like someone who might be cheerfully denying loans to widows and orphans. Enjoy, Corinne said in a murmur barely audible above the buzz of the already crowded party. You know where the drinks are, I'm sure. After flashing a knowing smile, she sashayed off, hips swaying, evidently intent on engaging a group of female faculty who were eyeing with covert disapproval the shiny black, high-heeled black boots that completed her ensemble. Always tasteful, Eileen said. That dress is so short you can just about see her religion. I shook my head and felt salt water shifting somewhere inside. I wonder if a whip came with the outfit. Eileen grinned. I'm having a sudden vision of the dean on all fours with a choke collar around his neck. As if he had heard his name mentioned, Dean Rimmer detached himself from a gaggle of senior faculty and fixed his toothy Cheshire cat smile on Eileen. Professor Moriarty, he boomed, extending his right hand, complete with a pinky ring worthy of a maf mafioso. You look quite fetching, if a trifle incongruous. Eileen smiled noncommittally, so he went on. Allow me to congratulate you on your forthcoming tomes. Film criticism, I understand. Eileen glanced at me to show she hadn't missed the Dean's inflection, then added, and an introductory literature textbook. Yes, Rimmer said, much more solid ground, potentially lucrative too. Eileen reluctantly took the Dean's proffered hand while I thought to myself, Christ on a crutch, had Rimmer actually said tomes? But before I could even catch Eileen's eye, Rimmer waved his arm expansively. I think Moriarty has bested his, uh, I should say, her rival for once. You've earned the right to partake at the high table, Eileen. The dean glanced at me like a horse buyer appraising a spavined nag. You, young Sherlock, will have to find refreshment over there as usual 
while you consider how to catch up professionally with your arch nemesis, if you'll forgive a bit of Holmesian jocularity. Again, Rimmer flashed the Cheshire grin, making me wish the Dean would follow through by disappearing into some Lewis Carroll phantasmagoria, preferably one full of bandersnatches and snarks. Eileen and I had often groused with other young arts and sciences faculty over Rimmer's barbaric custom of setting up a table of premium wines, liquors, and beers for associate and full professors, and another with cheap drinks for junior faculty and graduate students. And now Eileen was being escorted to rub elbows with what passed for the college's elite, leaving me to choose among half gallon jugs of Almaden, cans of Miller Lite, and fifths of Jim Beam or Vat 69. To her credit, Eileen did manage an eye roll before Rimmer propelled her to the heavily ornate mahogany table laden with imported beers, vintage wines, and single malt scotches, and surrounded by some of the most pretentious bores on campus, including the pale and pudgy Professor Neil Christman. The, the chairman of my TPC subcommittee eyed me briefly like an entomologist ready to skewer a negligible specimen then turned to more important matters, like metaphorically kissing the asses of his senior colleagues. Well, Dennis gets rescued uh, by the offer from Wayne State. He goes there and has a very successful uh, opening of his play and he also meets a former neighbor from out east named Andrea, who is married to an insufferable uh, uh, husband. Uh, they had been his neighbors uh, when he was uh, uh, at the University of Delaware uh, going to graduate school. So he has this affair and uh, it feels a little odd to him. And after the opening night of his play, uh, sort of dizzy with success, he starts back to his uh, uh, bed and breakfast on the Wayne State campus and is mugged and really was in fear for his life, but he manages to wrest the two by four away from the mugger who hit him with it and hits the mugger himself who is wearing a ski mask and gloves. And the next day, uh, we uh, rejoin him. A lot has happened, as you may be able to tell. But <clears throat> he wakes the next day. I must have fallen asleep, because the next thing I knew, the telephone was ringing on the nightstand beside me, making me jump and sending another stab of pain through my skull. I noted by the clock next to the phone that about half an hour had passed since I had lain down. Then I picked up the receiver and spoke carefully as if my voice might trigger a further shock. Hello? Sorry to disturb you, Mr. McCutcheon. The soft baritone wasn't quite in the James Earl Jones register, but pretty close. This is Robert on the front desk. You have a visitor. Should I send him over to your room or would you prefer to see him in the breakfast area? Visitor? Could it be another reporter? Ed, Larry Durant, Dean Fox, did he give a name? He's from the police. Robert's voice was free of inflection. The information hung for a few seconds in the electronic void. For various reasons, I felt a shiver of guilt. Then I said, I guess you'd better send him over to my room. I replaced the receiver and got out of bed, put on my shoes and walked into the bathroom. Deciding against more painkillers, I sloshed some water on my face and rubbed my hands over my eyes. Surprisingly, this actually made me feel better. By the time I had toweled myself off, I heard a soft but authoritative knock. I opened the door. Given Detroit's current demographic, I was unsurprised to see my visitor was African American. I was, however, startled to see that the cop, rather than being in uniform, was wearing what looked like a tailored gray suit with an understated stripe, a lime green shirt, 
a narrow tie in muted pink, and stylish brown chukka boots in smooth grained leather. The man looked 40-ish with the beginnings of a paunch, and his dark-skinned forehead gleamed below his grain close-cut hair. I'm Sergeant Lindenbrook, he said, the timbre of his voice coming closer to Darth Vader than Roberts, and you'd be Mr. Dennis McCutcheon. He extended his hand and we shook, firm grip, slightly sandpapery feel. Come on in, I said, gesturing toward the room's armchair. Lindenbrook sat and I took the desk chair, realizing as I did that sitting came as a relief. I didn't expect a mugging would rate this level of response. Trying for a non-committal tone, I added, did you catch the guy? Lyndon Brooks' mouth twitched in what might have been a smile. We've spoken with officers Dooley and Hernandez about your case, and it's still under active investigation. You're a little higher profile than our usual victims. He fished his cell phone from a pocket and said, you don't mind if I record our conversation just for accuracy's sake. I thought for a second, feeling uneasy. I suppose not, I finally said. Go ahead. Good. Lindenbrook clicked on the record button. This will make things simpler. I just have some follow-up questions on a possibly related matter. The detective paused as if reluctant to say more, so I said, related matter? I too waited to see what all this parroting might produce. Lindenbrook looked at me impassively, no doubt used to this sort of verbal poker. He finally said, first off, you told Dooley and Hernandez you figured you were attacked by some random mugger, is that right? I felt something stir inside at the question. I seemed to be reeling from one narrative to another. Academic novel, showbiz saga, ghost story, trashy romance, and now an episode of Law and Order. Then I reminded myself that though I was the victim here, I wasn't necessarily innocent and that I had better focus. Well, I said, the guy was wearing a ski mask and gloves and he attacked me from behind, so what can I say? Took a while for you to say that, Lindenbrook said, passing a finger across his neatly trimmed mustache. I allowed myself a ration of indignation, righteous or not. I'm not really tracking too well right now, I said, gesturing at the stitches on my scalp. And I already said as much to the officers at the hospital, Dooley and, and Hernandez, Lyndon Brooks applied. So just to make sure, you're saying you didn't know your assailant. I'm not sure why you'd think I would have. Lyndon Brooks allowed another obviously tactical measure of silence, then said, you wouldn't happen to be acquainted with a couple named Durant, would you? A thrill of shock passed through me. I decided to play for time. Squeak, I said. Lyndon Brooks' head tilted slightly back to a, in a pretty good single take. Come again? Cat and mouse, I said, with what I hoped was a disarming smile. And I guess I'm the mouse. That's right, Lyndon Brooks nodded. Your playwright, good with dialogue, he paused. So I take it you do know the Durants. Deciding I might as well get on with it, I said, they were my next door neighbors years ago when I was in graduate school out east. I was surprised to run into them here in Detroit. They read about my coming to Wayne State for my play and took me out to dinner at Fishbones. Good food there, Lindenbrook grinned, then pressed on. Mrs. Durant's a fine looking woman. This all seemed to be moving too quickly. She is, I said, always has been. So, Lyndon Brooks said, could it be you somehow got crosswise with Mr. Durant, maybe over his fine looking wife and that this so-called mugging wasn't so random after all? Jesus, I felt blood surging to my face. I'm the victim of a masked attack. If you suspect Larry Durant, why don't you ask him? Lindenbrook gave me one of those opaque stares. I'd love to, he said at last, but Mr. Durant's in no position to answer. He's dead. Thank you. It gets complicated, <laughs> at least for our hero. Yeah.
We'll see. and listening yes. we'd be delighted to answer any questions you might have about either book or about anything else ernie this is r riley can you hear me yes i can good um as you know i've read swept away and enjoyed it a lot tense dialogue very funny i mean taught dialogue um Janet pointed out that nobody in that novel is particularly likable, certainly the academics. And I guess thinking about it as you were reading, the, the hotel people are, or bed and breakfast people, they're helpful and nice and want to help, but you really skewer the academics in the Eastern University. <laughs> I wonder where that comes from. Yeah. Uh. I think there are lots of nice people in it. Lean, I think, is a wonderful character. Um, yeah. You know. No, I'm refer. I'm not referring yeah. to the main three. But main people are fine. And the director of the play. Yeah, and yeah. redhead. And the cast. And the cast. Rachel. Yes, that's right. The cast is good. <laughs> Forward young lady, I might say. Ah, yes. It's easier to uh, make fun of people who are. Not quite so nice. If every if everyone in a novel were nice, there wouldn't be much of a story. Oh, I'm not saying as a criticism. I just uh, no, no. I I understand. I understand. Yeah. What you're saying it's hard to write about academe without being satirical. Right. Yeah. And you really it's funny. I'd hate to be the target. Uh, well, you know the funny thing is uh, uh, the, the the book is obviously. Uh, fiction, uh, but uh, the the stuff that happens at the at the beginning out out east, uh, all those strange things that the academics do, they're, they're all true, <laughs> In, including the separate uh, drink oh, table. Yes. That's I, yeah. just amazing. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think it the, these days. Yeah, and the Mr. Monkey book is out now. It's available. Uh, it it will it will launch on July seventh. But uh, our wonderful uh, uh, city resource uh, Dean Hauk has copies available at the Michigan News, and it's available for pre-order on uh, all the usual online suspects: uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, book depository, I think. Right. Oh, uh, I might say all those characters in the Mr. Monkey book are very likable. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Yeah. yeah. Arnie, I, uh, I'm one that uh, read the book only because, not only because, but uh, Dean Howe insisted that I read it. Ah. Because once Dean says you got to read this book, of course, that's, you have to read it. Uh, it just happened that the week before the uh, the date the week before I started to read it, I had gone to uh, Detroit to visit my my daughter Nancy, who happens to live right in the corner of Wayne State University, virtually in the backyard of the the inn at um, on Curry Street, and uh, I was uh, that weekend. She took me all over Detroit, and I didn't. She take me various places and so on, and but I found it fascinating because the detail with which you described. Uh, uh, Detroit itself is, is fantastic. Uh, I felt like I, I was just there. I just saw that. I know exactly what he's looking at. But you, you are from Detroit, is that correct? What's your background? Yeah, I, I, I'm originally from Scotland. My parents and I uh, arrived here dec <laughs> decades ago. Uh, and I went to uh, elementary school, high school, and college at Wayne State. Uh, and uh, I I left there to go to graduate school at the University of Delaware after graduating from, from Wayne State, and then uh, found my way after that to uh, Kalamazoo. And the interesting thing is, of course, that uh, I left Detroit uh, as a resident a long, long time ago. So uh, when you 
uh, undertake to write a, a novel or, or anything very complicated, uh, you have to do research. So I, I actually did research uh, for this book about just to remind myself about Detroit and also try to make sure I didn't have too many anachronisms that I was so that I was describing a Detroit that no longer existed. Well, but that change in Detroit has been so so uh, radical in the last couple of decades, especially yes, here. It's a fantastic place to be now. It really yes. is. It's one of the. It wouldn't. People talk about the old days, the riots, and all that stuff, and then and you wonder what are they talking about? It's not the same. Yeah. Same and place. I lived there. I lived there pre-riot. So I, in fact, I I lived there before there were any expressways. Right. And, right. And I, frankly, there's a, a part of me inside that feels as if the expressways uh, were the beginning of uh, deleterious change to the city. Absolutely. Because yeah. they chopped those things down. My daughter worked in, uh, in uh, nonprofits and she described the, the way that the, uh, the Ambassador Bridge entrance had, had uh, split uh, Mexican town and the old Verner neighborhood right in no. two and, you know, and had done the same thing. Well, you could just see it by looking at the Fisher Freeway all the downtown freeways are just basically saying, well, let's go through this neighborhood because they're not very important, you know. Exactly, and get out get out of town. Get out of town right away, yep. Yeah. As long as you got a straight track to the Joe or to the uh, uh, to Tiger Stadium or Ford Field and got a straight shot out to the suburbs, you're cool. Yep. yep. How long have you been writing this book and were you writing the children's book at the same time? Uh, actually, we began writing the children's book uh, before I began writing the novel. We, we, we worked on the children's book a while ago, and interestingly, you would think because it's short, it wouldn't take so long, but it took a long time, actually, to write it between other things. So. Yeah, because we had lots of other projects. And we wrote it originally in prose, and then we decided it would be fun for parents and grandparents to read aloud to uh, children and grandchildren if it rhymed. So we uh, cast it into rhyming couplets. I really well, enjoyed that. It, you did a great job. We have um, our youngest grandson is four. And ah. he just turned four, and he would love that. And he often brings over Mr. Monkey, he calls him, Mr. Monkey. And Mr. Ah. Monkey, for him, it is his child. He is the dad, and he wants to boss Mr. Monkey around. Ah. <laughs> that could be in your next book. <laughs> yes, it, 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 it might well. And the novel took me to write maybe about a year. Um, and the problem with, uh, with writing for publication or production is that you often finish things long before they actually right. appear in print or on stage. Right. Uh, because those of us who write like to write, that's, that's our main, uh, uh joy in life and marketing is not exactly our forte. Uh, so we, we have, out of necessity, you, you work at marketing and marketing takes a long time because if you're a writer of any kind, I'd say if you're getting 10% acceptances out of the 100% of things you send out, you're doing pretty well. Now, if you're if you're John Grisham, let's say, <laughs> you're, you're already sold before you write it. But uh, the rest of us aren't quite that fortunate. Are there more questions? Yes. Hi, I'm Chris Jankars. Uh, I was just wondering how you got your start and actually since you were already touching on it, how you uh, got your start into um, 
publishing. I, I actually write, but I am my degree. I love your academic stuff because I went through my dissertation about 10 years ago. <laughs> and uh, I kind of identify with a lot of that stuff. <laughs> but I would just like to hear about how you got started and, and how you get, got your first book published and stuff like that. You know, what you really have to do is set some time aside, look up in the books that suggest places to send your work and just send it out. And lots of people, lots of places say you can't double submit, but you can, you can, you know, if three people want your work, that would be amazing. So, you know, I, you, if you have poems or short stories, find places, go online, send them out and, uh, you know, becoming a member of, uh, uh, any of the writers organizations uh, like uh, associated writing programs or poets and writers. Uh, those are all uh, good sources of marketing uh, advice and uh, lists of places to send. For me, I got started uh, uh, in, in graduate school as a teacher of modern literature and development of the novel. That's what I came to Western to teach. And while I was doing that, I kept publishing uh, other stuff, poems and so forth. And I actually was, I am so ancient that I actually was one of the co-founders of the creative writing program at Western. And then when I wrote uh, a couple of successful plays, uh, they asked me if I'd uh, start a playwriting program. So that, that's part of the reason I wound up doing uh, what I did. And I taught creative writing for many years. My first book was actually a scholarly uh, book about the novelist William Golding, the writer of Lord of the Flies. And uh, then I, I just kept writing short stories and and plays and, and poems, and the rest just sort of happened. This has been very enjoyable. I do have to be excused, and I didn't want to just leave. So thank you, thank you. And uh, this was a wonderful yeah. opportunity. Lovely to see you again. You too. Take care. Bye. Yeah. As I promised, I want to uh, drop into the chat here the link for the KPL podcast called Five Author Questions. Um, and you can search through the episodes on that to actually get to Arnie and Debs. It actually takes you to Apple Podcasts to find it. But um, if you want to copy that link or click on it here, you'll be able to hear a little bit more from them in that little interview that they did at KPL. So thanks for doing that. And I want to thank you all for attending tonight. And you may receive uh, an email link to uh, an evaluation. And we would appreciate your feedback because it will help us plan future programs. So Thanks again, Arnie and Deb. And if Thank there you. are. Thank you all so much. Yeah. If there are no other questions, we'll see you soon. Yes. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.